Let's go live now to Melbourne. I'm joined by Dr Colin Rubenstein. He's a, a long-time executive director at the Australia, Israel and Jewish Affairs Council. Colin, thanks for your time. I spoke to Josh Burns, the member for McNamara earlier, who spoke very movingly about the impact on the Jewish Australian community that so many Jewish Australians have loved ones, have family members, friends, that so many know people affected by these atrocities, I guess it's still a state of shock and mourning for many here in Australia too. There's no doubt about that, Karen. It's a shocking uh, uh, development. Uh, it's taken everyone by surprise. The sheer barbarity of the terrorists um, is uh, beyond uh, belief and really beyond contempt. Um, the shameless brutality against children and women and uh, disabled elderly ladies, deliberately butchering them, uh, humiliating them to the nth degree and celebrating that. that. That is a shock, I think, to all Australians. It's particularly painful and shocking uh, to the Jewish world and to the Australian uh, Jewish community uh, in general. I'm sure to, to most Australians, this is totally unacceptable, depraved butchery, war crimes in the extreme, deliberately attacking and killing mm -hmm. civilians in a terrorist, in a war. And uh, it uh, it's a tipping point. It represents a tectonic change, I think, in the Middle East. It's a watershed that uh, has brought to light to those who didn't uh, understand or want to understand the reality of Hamas, uh, that it is committed uh, to the absolute destruction of Israel. And uh, this has always been the fundamental barrier to moving forward to this sort of reconciliation and a peaceful outcome yeah. that most reasonable people want, certainly the Israelis have want, wanted and have offered on so many occasions over the last 30 years. Well, you, you know Israel better than anyone, this has eerie, really eerie similarities to the shock and the surprise of that 1973 attack, albeit traditional warfare in 1973. This is anything but, as you said, with war crimes and terrorism on show in the last 24 to 48 hours. Now, from what you've seen here, this surprise attack... It must shock you in the sense that the advanced IDF, they're one of the most advanced militaries in the world, the intelligence agencies, are some of the best in the world, how this could have been allowed to happen again 50 years on. Indeed, 50 years to the day, again, uh, an unbelievable, un unexpected, unbelievable shock uh, and, and surprise. That was an existential threat to Israel's very... Uh, being, of course, had those uh, armies broken through up on the Golan and down in the Sinai, it didn't actually affect to the same extent people on the ground in Israel proper in the way that this attack is doing uh, to this very moment. Over a thousand Israelis killed, butchered, uh, many more injured, uh, yeah. well over 2,000 uh, hostages, two to uh, 230 uh, at least. Uh, this is having a massive effect. Uh, this is uh, Israel's 9-11 uh, to the nth degree. Uh, Israeli yeah. sort of vulnerability is on show here. And yes, an intelligence failure uh, of the highest order, uh, that will be a shock. But the sort of uh, cat and mouse game that's been played with Hamas, because Israel's understood the nature of Hamas rejecting the peace offers because they don't want their state alongside Israel. They want the state, you know, instead of Israel. And in fact, of course, Hamas represents uh, extreme uh, Islam. Its charter shows that it's about uh, Islamist uh, revival. It's a threat to other Arab Sunni countries, of course. Uh, and if it's uh, attack, as, as anybody following these events understands, is really only made possible by the largesse, by the financial support, by the armed support of Iran. And uh, this, of yeah. course, represents a threat not just to Israel, it represents a threat to so many countries, Arab countries, uh, in the broader Middle East. The, when you look at the Israeli politics of the last few years, I, I know not everyone keeps up with it, but you certainly do, there's been a lot of division 
a lot of polarisation within Israeli politics and the debate there. This will bring Israelis together, but is that part of the reason why there was a blind spot that, that has seen this atrocity perpetrated? Yes, I think there are two basic reasons uh, for the events, with the advantage of hindsight. Undoubtedly, uh, the very divisive, polarising debate within Israel over judicial reform uh, has uh, attracted the attention of Israel's enemies, uh, giving them to believe that uh, Israel is somewhat uh, a paper tiger, that uh, it's imploding, it's collapsing, uh, and certainly uh, encouraging them to develop these plans to attack when Israel is is distracted. And uh, unquestionably, uh, that has been uh, a factor. The other factor, of course, that we need to take into account is the increasing uh, coexistence and reconciliation between Israel and the Arab world, the Abraham Accords, uh, which are, are genuine, are deep, are meaningful, and, of course, were threatening uh, to be extended in a very uh, important uh, way in terms of Saudi Arabia and Israel establishing a high degree of normalisation. And uh, these two factors, uh, perhaps amongst others, uh, are certainly helped to explain uh, the, the logic underlying the planning for this uh, very extreme uh, attack. Um, it could also, of course, uh, hopefully show the way uh, forwards in the sense that, it's, in a way, it's Israel under attack uh, in a huge way, but uh, the Iranian involvement and the Iranian game plan represents a threat to all of the moderate actors in the Middle East, the, the broader Arab uh, Sunni world, and they well know it, which, of course, yeah. is one of the reasons that they had developed these uh, very meaningful and constructive ties with Israel. There was a rally uh, closer to home in Sydney where an imam spoke uh, while celebrating the outcome of these events in Israel. What What's your reaction to that? I know James Patterson, the Liberal senator, has warned anyone attending another rally uh, in a couple of hours from now in Sydney that Hamas and Hezbollah are both listed terrorist organisations and anyone with that sort of paraphernalia, flags or supporting those groups could face the, the, uh, the, uh, the scrutiny of intelligence and security agencies. Well, I can only agree with you. I mean, uh, Hamas and Hezbollah, Palestinian Islamic Jihad, they're prescribed terrorist organisations in this democratic, multicultural uh, uh, nation, uh, as they should be. So, uh, yes, I would say the authorities would be looking at the legal uh, dimensions of this, because morally, uh, this stance is profoundly offensive, I think, to all Australians, certainly to all Jewish Australians, when we've seen such brutal atrocities occur and keep occurring. They're totally inconsistent with the values of a democratic, multicultural Australia. I'm sure they're being widely con Dems from shore to shore in this country. Uh, and uh, I can't believe that uh, any uh, mainstream Australian uh, uh, today would have anything but uh, absolute contempt and revulsion when they see these celebrations uh, taking place. And would you hope that our security agencies are keeping a very close eye on subsequent rallies and protests of solidarity. I, I not only would hope, but I, I, I'm sure that they uh, almost certainly will be. And uh, that is uh, absolutely necessary uh, in the circumstances. Uh, the, there are limits to free speech and protest. There's, there's no right to promote hatred and uh, extol uh, uh, violence uh, and brutality and bestiality that we see on display. I think all mainstream Australians would agree with those sentiments and would expect our authorities to take the appropriate steps. Dr Colin Rubenstein, thank you for your time as always. We'll stay in touch.